Hi, I'm Frillin Wild. I lead a small lab uh, at the Technical University of Oxford in, in Oxford Brooks. I call it the Performance Augmentation Lab. But I have to admit, I'm talking to you here standing on the shoulders of giants, and that is uh, the Wicked Project Consortium, a partnership uh, Horizon 2020 funded in which we have um, built this project um, that I'm going to talk to you about. But let me start with the context in which we do this. And the context is the context of, of working, of working and training. From the moment this morning that you got out of bed till you arrived here, how many of the people you have met that you have seen, you think their jobs are future-proof? I think it's quite reasonable to assume, as our colleagues at Oxford University do, that there are a number of jobs that are at risk with the wave of automation that we're going through, with the wave of robotics, um, and um, there are nice websites, humor me, try it yourself, um, bit.ly, job gone, um, see if your profession or your friend's profession is future-proof. and. Um, of course, if you investigate uh, the types of skills required and then uh, calculate the probability from it, there are quite a number of jobs that are maybe at risk of um, in, the, in the future, in the medium and uh, near future maybe even. There are jobs that are even very much at risk um, if you believe these predictive studies. But there are others uh, that probably are not that much at risk one would think, um, like actors, entertainers, and presenters. Would you? So, this is an example from a couple of years ago from the uh, neighboring lab, the Cognitive Robotics Lab, uh, where they had built a comedian and performed with the Robotespian comedian Artie on the BBC very successfully, and that's uh, Nigel Crook, um, the head of the Cognitive Robotics Lab and our Dean of Research and Knowledge Exchange. So, that sounds scary, and if you look at the further studies um, coming from the Oxford Internet Institute, it is even more scary. There are further um, skills and professions that may be at risk of being replaced by artificial intelligences uh, or some other form of automation. Um, if you don't follow the scaremongering voices, it still is a, an amount. Um, maybe there is an amount of 9% of the jobs at present that could be replaced by automation. But that's enough with the scaremongering. Um, it is at the same time that there are a lot of new jobs emerging. Jobs change. Jobs change over time and new skills are required. And of course, if you don't upskill, um, you will have to look for different employment uh, at some, some point in the future. The skills crisis that we're hit hard by globally in the uh, developed world um, is as big as, um, at the moment, 800,000 positions in the UK alone open and um, companies reporting or expecting tremendous difficulties, not only in the UK because of Brexit and other reasons, but um, across the globe in developing countries to recruit people. So that is the backdrop against which we started um, to apply for funding and then managed to um, get uh, 3 million euros of funding to build the next generation training system, training for zero. How does it work? We have a three-part solution. We have a recorder, an application that um, helps to unobtrusively as possible record what an, what an expert does. We call it experience capturing. We use for that an e-textile solution, a harness that can be dressed in different clothings. And we use then a very uh, aesthetically pleasing and uh, fun to use uh, player that uh, supports the um, experience reenactment. The harness uh, that we've developed um, in a big participatory design process over the past um, two and a half years um, consists of that technology basically. You can see there are a couple of interesting components like um, spine posture with um, inertia measurement units and um, some additional biosignals such as 
variable heart frequency measurement devices or galvanic skin resistance. Um, there are also um, additional armbands in the sleeve that do um, electromyography or um, additional movement sensing that you don't see on this chart here. It looks like this. It's a hardware platform that we developed, which is quite flexible and adaptable so that we can plug in additional components at ease and have done so over the time, um, but can also then be dressed in, in different types of clothing, as I already explained. So on the, in the middle, you can see one of the earlier design um, that we had. And on the right, you see the pure harness against the backdrop of one of the pilot partners with whom we worked. What can we do with this? We can do stuff like this. We can record unobtrusively using the sender framework and uh, a HoloLens what an expert does, asking the expert to explain, maybe convert a bit of the tacit knowledge they have in their heads, and then replay it using something we call a ghost, a ghost track that um, allows a trainee to follow in the footsteps of the expert, look at what the expert focuses on, how he handles things, how she um, talks about things, and so on. But that would be not enough. Of course, um, the recording framework that we have developed supports other types of annotations. Um, you walk through the space and can create so-called task stations, like um, at the entrance of an airplane or here on an ultrasound machine. And step-by-step um, step in situ annotate the different uh, action steps that are required to conduct the uh, training activity that you're about to learn about. This supports a variety of different tasks, learning tasks, supportive information tasks, procedural information oriented ones, and uh, practice oriented ones, for which we've developed a rich set of kind of instructional design elements, some of which you've seen already in that radial menu on the last slide, some of which you can see in action here, like, of course, dropping um, 3D graphics and elements where required, um, doing audio annotations, video images, um, the whole canon of the usual things, but a few more innovative ones like the ghost track we've seen earlier or um, a ghost hands application. This is completely different in the philosophy from how the player works. The player is much more focused out there on the, on the world out there. The recorder is something that is inward facing, so you've spent a lot of time in manipulating the virtual elements, whereas in the player it is about um, learning by doing, putting the theory into practice, putting information on where it's required at the point in time when it is required. It looks a little bit like that. That's um, an earlier um, recording of one of the trials we did with Altec in Italy. This is a mounting procedure of a storage rack on the International Space Station, which we uh, tested with astronauts and astronauts in training and astronaut trainers in uh, uh, an ISS simulator module. Um, you can see at the beginning of the sequence the task list that shows also with the tick boxes. This is the step series that you need to do and then bit by bit it guides to the right location and explains what needs to be done. Under the bonnet, this solution is compatible with the IEEE ARLEM standard or emerging standard. It's close to standardization. The last work is being wrapped up and it should be submitted to the um, standardization committee um, rather soon. ARLEM consists of two parts. It has a reusable workplace description language that allows to explain that this is a desk, this here is a clicker, and uh, over there is an airplane which consists of different parts, um, which then are featured in the workflow description language in the activity model that is built to particularly support um, learning activities with augmented reality, visual overlays or under for other forms of augmentation. Um, also has built in Internet of Things support that you will see in a small while when I show you a more recent uh, footage of one of our test beds. Watch your step while performing the task. This is 
a test procedure that we've just run with uh, about 150 astronauts on a physical surface simulator. Next. At our partner okay. site in Italy. First you find the can see the panel. physical surface of then Mars and a Mars rover, of which the there are many. The and it ex asks you to Next. go step okay. by step through some maintenance procedures, Visually some inspection inspect procedures, and, verify that they are and in a second also no swap the activity and switch over so to sensors. a different task yeah. as we simulated a fault using Internet of Things technology that um, would in that situation be life-threatening. Error detected in Module 2. Activity changed to Module 2 error repair. So you can see again Next. the representation of the task steps required and then the mapping to the action cards. The, the action cards follow you around window. unless you lock then them somewhere. The box by and the, the, key to the lock guiding the lines on the floor device. direct you to where the action happens. Explaining Next. Explaining step by step what you need to do. Done. Reset module 2 by first turning the power toggle down and then long pressing the big red button. Check the environment sensors from the sensors yeah. panel. So we see the activity, the branch out activity has now been completed and we, we return and back the life to the maintenance box. procedure on the rover. Um, Next. I invite you to come over and look at our booths to see more of that and also maybe try out some things. But for here, I wanted to share a few of the underlying research findings um, of the two waves of pilot trials that we have conducted. We have developed a new technology acceptance model that is more apt for augmented reality and wearable technologies and can evaluate very quickly the level of acceptance you're likely to find um, using prototypes or using even earlier feedback uh, with video solutions or mood boards, um, which has a high degree of predictive power um, and enhances the existing user um, acceptance uh, models um, for in particular with factors surrounding interoperability and wearability. Um, we have measured with that and are currently still measuring the levels of acceptance that we're finding. And um, as you can see on the top right here, the levels of acceptance are quite high, um, though, of course, leaving a bit of room for improvement. So that's from the first wave of trials. We expect that the second one has significant improvement over that, but we're currently measuring that. We have also investigated um, uh, other aspects um, that have to do with the user experience. In particular, we have um, uh, really nice contribution about the level of simulated sickness that you would find using the, the HoloLens, the development devices that we're working with. And we can confirm that uh, other than in virtual reality applications, you do not find a significant share of your audience getting motion sick. Um, there are, however, interesting um, aspects that um, may provide room for improvement, both on the software as well as on the hardware side, uh, with respect to eye strain, which is... Um, probably not completely unconnected to people with age short-sightedness slowly walking backwards whenever they have an augmented reality experience. I don't know if you've no noted that. Um, it may be connected to that. And it, of course, depends on the use cases, as you can see in the di difference between um, the different colored test beds here. But um, generally, um, that's, that's the finding that we had, that there are some aspects of simulator sickness that could deserve more attention, both on the hardware as well as on the software side. We've also investigated um, the satisfaction with uh, user interaction on the smart glasses. And um, without boring you too much with the details of the question that we had there, um, an interesting finding was uh, the investigation of the demographics. So we did not find any difference between uh, genders, um, and gender mainstreaming, I think, is, is a great thing. Um, and my lab is half-half male-female. I think that uh, is something that we should take into account in, in uh, future versions of Augmented World Expo. Um, there are also no noticeable differences between young and old. We found, however, a significant difference between uh, the level of computer knowledge people already have. Minded that the um, 150 people we sent through this exercise 
um, were never before in a smart glasses augmented reality experience. Um, so they had no prior exposure to this and um, a very strong predictor of their satisfaction levels is in fact computer knowledge and to a less, lesser degree internet knowledge. That was uh, very interesting. Um, which you also see then depicted here on the um, breakout chart on the right, comparing the three different test sites and uh, the reported self-reported uh, level of computer knowledge against the average score of uh, the questionnaire on interaction satisfaction. We have uh, done a variety of qualitative investigations as well and further quantitative investigations with a rich set of papers already published, several in submission and a few future ones to be written. Um, quite interesting, I think, um, and quite practical, we looked into interaction styles, um, investigating qualitatively um, the differences and preferences and feedback of uh, smaller groups of people with respect to sequential navigation and spatial navigation. We found, um, for example, um, that for sequential navigation, the task cards, people prefer a flat user interface over something three-dimensional. Um, interestingly, they also s preferred air tapping over voice and they preferred um, horizontal layout, which probably has to do with the display size over vertical layout. With respect to the spatial navigation, like where you need to be, what you need to do, how you need to handle objects, um, that effect is then different. So of course, the hint lines that we invented are very, very useful in providing an overview first on where you need to be during that sequence, but also then providing the detail um, later and guiding you to the exact step and the exact spot where you need to be. Um, we have also investigated further the user satisfaction with interviews and um, that table on the left is a bit big for you probably to, to read in full. Interestingly, there are a lot of um, polarizing statements that you find both as a pro as well as a con. Just for example, um, people complained about um, that it's uh, too complicated, but at the same time other people said it's easy to use, so it's quite certainly not necessarily the, the software um, that they have tested. It is something deeper and probably the uh, underlying computer knowledge, for example, makes a difference, but it may also be personal preferences. Um, Similarly, you find um, yeah, the bulkiness uh, on the one side, but then at the same time other people saying it's light, which um, seems to indicate also different levels of expectation of how heavy a smart glasses device can be or is expected to be, and uh, also at the same time prior exposure to similar virtual reality devices, for example. Yeah, um, at the moment we're in the second wave of trials and we um, are investigating in the other two test bits uh, further how the procedures work. Um, the other two test bits, some parts of which you've already seen are airplane maintenance in which we're testing some more complicated procedures um, as well as in the medical area working with EBIT, our partner company in uh, Genoa on um, training doctors and ultrasound procedures. The first one that we did was on uh, scanning a carotid for signs of clogging, which are the risk factors for heart attacks. Um, but there are further um, scans required, um, like or for the scan procedures that we're currently um, preparing um, that we want to test here on um, liver inspection, for example. I do not recommend this after tonight's reception. Um, yeah, Lufttransport is our partner in Norway, EBIT and um, Altec in Italy, but there are a lot of other partners around which you can also find and talk to at our boot, which is at uh, number 217. 
where you can find out more and try out more about the solution we have created. Thank you. Do we have questions for Fridolin? Yeah, over there. Hi, thanks for sharing that. It's uh, really fascinating to see someone um, spending so much time looking at um, usability and um, user research and things around that area. I think it's really a space that um, we need more research on. Um, but I wondered how much of um, this group or kind of collective is just um, the universities themselves or do you partner um, with other groups, uh, either corporations or even uh, maybe smaller independent developers outside of, I mean, it's, they, a lot of those look like universities. Maybe I just don't know those brands. Um, but how, do you, how does that collaboration then, I guess, kind of work? Do they um, come to um, you with a problem and then you have to like create a research problem around it? Or is it something where you know, they might sponsor you guys to investigate the problem for them? So I, let me give you two answers to that, one for my lab and one for our partnership. So for my lab, um, we spent uh, a good share of our time trying to fix problems and um, another smaller share of our time trying to invent problems or do stuff that nobody wants. So um, just for fun, these, for example, Will, who is probably somewhere here in the audience, um, yeah, he um, built for the latest Star Wars launch last year a little uh, lightsaber application um, that did sensor fusion because, of course, if you have a lightsaber fight, uh, the optical tracking with the hands is a bit, mm, you want a bit more freedom in a lightsaber fight if you ever want to go one. So, um, parts of it, of course, is um, playfully exploring technology and seeing what we could do, even if it doesn't lead anywhere. But the significant share of it we spend uh, on um, pretending to do serious work and never have fun. Um, as for the partnership, um, the way we collaborate is, is um, we have, of course, different expertise in the partnership. So the technology that you've seen, um, we use the standard SDKs, but otherwise this is all our own invention including the hardware design. Um, the core technical partners are in, in our project um, Oxford Brooks, um, then the Open University of the Netherlands and VTT, as well as RWTH Aachen and um, some part of the work of Ravensbourne. Um, whereas then the, the rest of the partnership deals more with exploitation-oriented aspects, with the um, applicability testing in the user test beds, and um, yeah, with, um, with the pedagogical models behind and the methodological aspects. The project is coming to a closure um, at the beginning of next year. And um, the question is timely, I think, with respect to possibilities for joint adventures, um, for exploring um, whether some parts of these technologies um, or sets or combinations or scaled down versions or yeah transformations of it can um, can be um, made happen so they that our work has an impact on a larger group of people than just the trial partners we have worked with we have a huge interest in that and um, we invite you all to come and talk to us at our boot um, we're open to explore further with you what road such exploitation can go down yeah. Besides that, I, of course, invite you to further explore research aspects um, with the involved labs um, beyond the commercial exploitation. And um, there are certainly possibilities to um, benefit from the knowledge that we've gained over the three-year heavily funded uh, research projects with over 30 people working on augmented reality in training for zero. Any more questions? Here we have one. Sorry, I missed the first two minutes. You talked a lot about uh, Microsoft HoloLens. Did you look at other augmented reality headsets? And mm -hmm. did you look at the difference that field of view makes for those experiences? So we, we have uh, a range of different devices. We've settled in the end then for the HoloLens for development, but um, it's not the only competitive device, um, just to 
drop a few more names of interesting devices. Of course, the Magic Leap is very interesting and a good device. Uh, of course, the ODG R7 is a great device, especially with a clip-on sensor. The Meta One, um, although that tethering is a bit of a pain in the settings we were using it. And there are others um, that are close to market. Um, even if the difference between the devices can be, can be big, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages, um, it is essentially, I think, a question of securing your content. And that's why we put so much effort into the standardization working group that we work on, to make sure that any content that we create for training is not locked away somewhere, but can be then migrated to other platforms. Um, that's kind of the basics. If you do your technical documentation and upgrade that for augmented reality, uh, then you certainly don't want to um, be at risk that you can never get it out anywhere. You also might want to throw a couple of things in from your different uh, system landscape. Besides that, I think um, from the framework, the software framework uh, for which the final architecture deliverable is appearing um, rather soon, uh, towards end of the year, uh, I think the way we encapsulated the technology um, allows us to create bindings to different tracking toolkits. Um, for example, we found a elegantly simple way of um, transferring content models that have relative locations in space from device to device, from place to place, from hangar to hangar, from airplane with those scratches to airplane with those scratches. And um, that just uses a simple recalibration, um, which could even be across toolkits, um, as some of the vendors out there, Apple, Microsoft, are already doing. I think that is uh, essential for work you do on multiple devices or also to secure the future and um, not risk being suddenly left alone when one of the players of the hardware you work with pulls out of the market for whatever reason. Yeah. So it's possible to do it uh, in a safe way if you pay attention from day one in your projects. And certainly there are the building blocks coming around like uh, open content standards um, that allow you to secure your content no matter what. Any more questions? I have one. I think it's a good ending question because everybody looks arguments how to sell AR. I would right now send the CEOs of companies who are interested to you. And they will ask you, you're, you're not a an, an seller of AR technology. You did background. What would you tell them? Would you tell them, go for AR, my data shows this, be careful, or wait five years? What would be your answer? If a CEO comes and says, I don't trust my uh, technology guys, I want to get it from you. Mm -hmm. So the answer is, um Think about how much it will cost you not to do it. I think it depends, of course, on the company, but um, it, with the types of companies we work with, it's more a question of think about the cost you will have if you don't do it, and then make a decision on that. If you want to be late in the market, fine. Okay. If you want to be spearheading things, then you're a little bit too late. <laughs> yeah. But um, if you're kind of with the rising majority, then it's now. It's now, and there are good reasons. So. Um, the evaluation results that we have show very clearly that there is a high level of acceptance of the technology around, that there is a high level of satisfaction, um, that there is an impact on, on the way people learn um, and the publication that will measure the impact on knowledge assessment uh, will appear at the beginning of next year and I'm okay. sure it's positive. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. That it is now and it will cost you more if you don't do it unless you decide that you're not a technology-oriented company. Great answer. <laughs> Hopefully everybody has recorded this and we played against all of the CEOs. This is what we need. Many thanks, Fridolin. <laughs>